everyone, and welcome to the motive of a faith-driven entrepreneur. My name is Paula Ferris. So I spent almost a decade at ABC News, where I was the co-anchor of Good Morning America Weekends and co-host of The View. But at the beginning of the pandemic, I took a hard left turn and decided to become an entrepreneur, where I'm now the founder of Carrie Media, which exists to advocate for working moms through content, resources, and storytelling. And if there's one thing that I see a whole lot of in the hyper-competitive spaces of media and entrepreneurship, it is an unhealthy perspective of career advancement. So often I see people claw and scratch their way to the top of that ladder, only to realize that the ladder was leaning against the wrong building. Have you been there? Getting to the top and thinking to yourself, huh, this is it? And also possibly compromising yourself on the way up that ladder? Well, I have been there and I have done that. This series is an opportunity for us to dive even deeper into the marks of a faith-driven entrepreneur. God's called each of us to create and he's given us the unique talents to make it happen. But how can we steward this well? What does it look like for our identity in Christ to guide the decisions that we make? Yes, excellence does matter, but how do we make sure we don't worship work? How do we love what we do, but not allow ourselves to become defined by what we do? This series is not focusing on how to become a better leader. Instead, it's focusing on why we become leaders in the first place, because if the why is off, guess what? It doesn't matter as much what the hows are. Our hope is that each of us can take a hard look at the motive for why we're leading and whether we should be leading at all, because it's only then that we can tap into the unparalleled source of power that Christ provides. And the best part is that when we discover God's true purpose for our life and our work, we can compete and win with a competitive advantage that's beyond any success offered by this world alone. Now, you may be going through this series with your faith-driven entrepreneur group, but some of you might be going through this study with one of your partners. Others might be hearing about faith-driven entrepreneur for the first time. If so, hi and welcome. The journey of an entrepreneur can be lonely, but it doesn't have to be. Faith Driven Entrepreneur is a global movement that's dedicated to gathering together a million Christ-following entrepreneurs all around the world, right outside our front doors and in our living rooms. The movement wants to connect and equip business visionaries like you to fulfill your call to create and transform the world around you. And Faith Driven Entrepreneur does this by providing quality content through a podcast, a blog, an app, a book that's titled Faith Driven Entrepreneur, as well as teaching series like the one you're watching. We are not meant to wrestle with things alone and we cannot build a business alone. That's why we say a lot around here that we want you to come for the content and we want you to stay for the community. Finding friends and allies is gonna be a key to your success on the road ahead, which is why you must be part of Faith Driven Entrepreneur's authentic community, an eight-week foundation group or ongoing entrepreneur groups. You'll be matched with a small, intimate group of like-minded entrepreneurs like yourself that just get it. You can meet together either online or in person. It's all free, there's no charge, no catch. Just Connection. You can find more information on the website, faithdrivenentrepreneur.org. New York Times bestselling author Patrick Lencioni has written a dozen books that focus on how leaders can build teams and lead organizations. Now, Patrick's a friend of the movement. He's also a faith-driven entrepreneur himself who leads a few businesses in the Bay Area of California. But today, he shifts his attention toward helping us understand the importance of why we are leading in the first place. The series is a great resource for a foundation or an entrepreneur group, like I mentioned, but it's also something that you can go through with your partners, maybe your leadership team, or possibly even your whole team. Patrick encourages us to honestly assess ourselves, and in doing so, he helps leaders avoid the pitfalls that stifle our organizations and even hurt the people that we are meant to serve. Let's watch. Hi, I'm Pat Lincioni, and I'm excited to talk to you today about the principles in my book, The Motive. Now, The Motive is the last book I wrote, actually. And it came out at a great time right before COVID shut down. And so it didn't have quite the, the uh, introduction that the other books I've written have had. But in fact, The Motive should have been the first book I ever wrote. Um, because after a, a, a career of working with people and helping them understand teams and leadership and how to build an organization and how to have meetings, everything else, what I realized was there was something missing. And I realized this one day when I was at a conference and I was working with CEOs in a room and, and answering their questions. And some of them were having a hard time receiving my advice. And I couldn't figure out why, because usually people were pretty 
receptive to it. And so I realized in talking to them that actually there was something missing and that was their motive, their reason for being a leader in the first place was not aligned with what it should be if we wanna be great leaders. And that's especially true if we're leading for Christ, if we're faith-driven leaders. And so what I realized is before I could introduce anybody to my principles about teamwork and leadership and vulnerability and organizational health, I needed to know that they were doing it for the right reasons. And in fact, there are two reasons, two motives why a person wants to become a leader. And I think about this every time I go to a graduation ceremony and somebody says, go out and be a leader, make a difference. Our motive has to be pure. And the two motives are one, I'm doing it because I'm reward centered. And when you tell an 18 year old or a 22 year old to go be a leader and make a difference, many of them are saying, that would be really cool because being a leader must be great because it comes with a lot of attention and some money and some control over my life and influence on others. And that is a very understandable and natural and dangerous reason to be a leader. And we're all susceptible to this because we've all fallen into this. The other motive for being a leader is that you wanna serve. It's responsibility centered. This is a burden. And when somebody makes you a leader, you get promoted to a position of management or you start a company, it is first and foremost a burden because you are now responsible for stewarding that role for the good of these people, your employees, your customers, partners, everybody else. So the right motive for being a leader is responsibility. It's kind of heavy and it's really important. Now with God's help and pure intentions, that can be a wonderful thing. But if you're doing it for your own personal economics, and I don't just mean financial economics, but what it does for you, you're gonna get really frustrated because I'll tell you what, leadership is never economically sound. <laughs> you are gonna give far more than you receive, which makes sense if you're a follower of Jesus because that's why we're here is to love others. Now we all receive things, but if we think that the economics are gonna play in our favor, that's not gonna make sense. And that's why it's so important that the world has faith-driven entrepreneurs who are willing to give far more than they receive, knowing that their rewards are eternal and even that there are rewards here. Now, in this day and age, in this modern time in the, in the church and in the world, being motivated the right way is so important because to be a faith-driven leader, you are going to suffer. It is, it is not a theoretical statement to say that we suffer if we're followers of Jesus. And if people know that we're followers of Jesus, there's a lot who might abandon us. And we have to love them through that, even as they turn away from us. And even as we get hurt by that, we can know that our motive is to love on them and to love on the people that stay with us and to love on the customers that belong with us and even on the ones that leave us. We can, we can do that if our motives are pure. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit more about the motive. We talked about the, the, the idea that we have to be motivated by serving others. And as Christ-centered leaders, we know that. That's what he showed us. But here's a few good ways to think about this because I, what I've noticed in all the things I teach about leadership, and about running an organization, practical day-to-day -day things. There's five things that reward-centered leaders, self-centered leaders, including myself when I've been there, often abdicate. Now, it depends on who you are and what you like to do. One of the things about being reward-centered is that we tend to think, I get to go to work every day and do what I feel like doing. I, I used to think that was really the reward I wanted. That I could go to my office and do what I felt like. Of course, if you're a responsibility-centered leader, you do what's necessary and what's required. And so here's five different things. And I've had leaders, I love it when they, they call or they write to me and they say, oh my gosh, Pat, I was 0 for 5. I don't do any of these things. And I realize now it's because I'm reward centered. And I'm so glad the humility of them to admit that and say, I'm going to change because this can be changed. So here's the five things you might want to ask yourself. And I'll tell you the ones that I struggle with. The first one is a lot of leaders who are reward centered, not responsibility centered, they abdicate responsibility for having difficult conversations with others. There's this issue and they can see that it's a problem and I have to go confront them and have a difficult conversation. Now, as a follower of Jesus, we know what iron sharpening iron means. You know, we have to be willing to enter the danger and love somebody enough, even if it's uncomfortable. But if you're reward centered, you're gonna go, I don't wanna do that. And I've seen leaders abdicate responsibility for that. I remember once I worked with a leader, a very famous guy that you've probably heard of, and one of his direct reports was telling everybody around him 
that he was going to become the next president and chief operating officer of the company. And this guy was not at all well liked by his peers. Well, somebody went to the CEO and said, are you going to make that guy the president and COO? And the CEO said, no, I'm not going to do that. He goes, are you going to tell him to stop telling everybody that? And he goes, no, I don't have time and energy for that. And so many leaders don't have the time and the energy. You know, it's just calling the guy up and saying, hey, buddy, you're not going to be the next president. You should stop telling everybody that. It's kind of pissing me off and something bad might happen to you if you don't stop, right? Have a great day. We don't have that conversation, even though it's an act of love to say, I want to correct you in that. So if we're reward-centered, we go, that's uncomfortable. I really don't like doing that. It's not fun. He could be upset. I'll just let it go because it doesn't bother me that much. But that's not living our responsibility as leaders. So the first one is having difficult conversations with people. And I promise that was a true story and I've had it happen. That kind of thing so many times in working with, with leaders. The next one is related to that, but it's different. And that's we have to manage our direct reports. I will tell you, I don't like this one. Managing your direct reports just means I know what they're working on. I'm helping them set goals. I'm available to them to coach them when they need help. And I'm following through with them. Well, I used to justify not doing this. I'm just not a very detail-oriented person. And I would say, well, I hire adults and they're good at what their jobs are. And I don't need to be on top of them and know what's going on. And a lot of leaders will say, I don't like to micromanage. That's not micromanaging, it's managing. And it's an act of love. And so I used to be kind of lazy about that and think that's okay. And one day I realized, oh, that's just because I don't feel like doing it. So managing your direct reports. And I find that this gets harder the higher people go up in an organization. No line level manager fails to do that, but many leaders, when they get higher, they just think, I don't have to do that anymore and I'm kind of glad I don't. So that's one of the things that people abdicate sometimes if they're giving in to reward-centered leadership. Another one is building a team, doing, doing team building sessions. Now, I love doing this. This is what I do for a living. So even as a reward-centered leader, I would do that because it was fun. But I know some CEOs who hate that kind of stuff. So they go, I'm just not going to do it or I'm going to farm it out to somebody else. Well, the truth is, if you're a leader, nobody else can be responsible for building your team. Just like having those hard conversations and managing your direct reports. So we have to say, whether I like this or not, I'm going to do it because it's necessary. So building your team and doing the, the interpersonal work necessary to do that is critical. Two more. One is many leaders I know don't like to repeat themselves. Repeating yourself as a leader is one of the most critical things we have to do. You know, like that old saying, like the woman who says, honey, why don't you ever tell me you love me? And the husband says, well, I told you when we got married, I'll let you know if it changes. Many leaders are like, I don't like to repeat myself. I find it to be redundant. It's a waste of time. People might think I'm stupid or that I think they're stupid. The best leaders in the world are constantly, constantly repeating themselves. Even if it's not fun, even if people make fun of them. As a parent, I know this because my kids constantly make fun of me. Dad, if you tell me to, you know, not do that one more time, I'm like, good for them for remembering. But at work, we often think, I don't want to have to do that. Great leaders repeat themselves. And the last one is that to be a great leader means, this is not sexy or interesting, that we have to run great meetings. Oh, so many leaders I know go, oh, if it weren't for meetings, I'd really love my job. But the truth of the matter is, the meeting is the playing field, the stage, the classroom, the, the operating room of business, of leadership, of organizations. A teacher would never say, I hate teaching in the classroom, or a surgeon would never say, I hate the operating room. A football player would never say, I hate the playing field, or an actor would never say, I hate the stage. But when a leader says, I hate meetings, it really is saying, I don't like what I do. Because that's where we lead. That's where we make difficult decisions. That's where we confront people and, 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 and make decisions for our customers. And so if you're reward-centered and you don't like running meetings, you will often abdicate it or try to avoid them as much as possible, and you won't be doing a good job. Okay, so you're a responsibility-centered leader, regardless of your personal preferences. You've got to have difficult conversations. You've got to manage your direct reports. You've got to repeat yourself constantly. You've got to build your team and you've got to have good meetings. Those are just the five super common areas that people tend to abdicate when they fall into reward-centered leadership. Now, I hope what you can do is look at those and whether you're 0 for 5 or 4 for 5 or 5 for 5, that you can constantly say to myself, I need to do this because it's, it's necessary regardless of where, whether I particularly enjoy it. Because being a leader can be a very enjoyable experience, but if that's our first reason to be a leader, then our motive is wrong in the first place. You know, people talk about servant leadership, and I, I, I used to love that. 
people, be a servant leader. And it comes back to Jesus, you know, and, and I love that. And there's books written about that. One day I realized though, I kind of don't like that anymore. Because when we say that person is a good servant leader, what we're doing is we're kind of saying that there's another type. You see, I think if you're not a servant leader, you're not a leader at all. If you're not a servant leader, then you're doing it for yourself and you're calculating what you feel like doing. I think I, I'm looking forward to the day when somebody says leadership and we all know what they mean is servant leadership. So let's all go, back, go out and be that way. And when we see in ourselves or others that they're not, help them realize that there's only one kind of leadership and that's to be a servant. So my message to you today is check your motive. Know that it can change at times. I've been at times in my career when I became very self-motivated, very much reward-centered, and things are off. So let's all check our motives, try to purify them, be responsibility-centered, not reward-centered, and give it all to Jesus. God bless you. Our ultimate reason for doing anything should be in worship to our Heavenly Father. That's the why behind everything. And the way that we do this, it should be a reflection of the love Jesus has for us. Our identity is found in Him alone, not in our own strength or the false facade that we try to project. That identity in Christ, it is a distinct marker of a faith-driven entrepreneur. We only need to look at the miracle Jesus performed on a hillside when He took two fish and a loaf of bread that He found in a kid's lunchbox and He made it feed 5,000 people. God doesn't need us, but He graciously invites us to participate in His redemptive work. The why for that child with the lunchbox was to serve God and the people who had gathered, that's it. And guess what, it should be the same for us. Patrick just went through a lot of information and you can find a whole lot more in his book. It is called The Motive. In that book, you'll discover why so many leaders abdicate their most important responsibility because they don't know why they are leading in the first place. It's a challenging topic that we're talking about. It's one we don't want you to go through alone. So if you're not going through this in a faith-driven entrepreneur group and you're interested in joining an eight-week foundation group, here's a quick two-minute look at what you can expect. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next session. From tech ventures to retail, from startup to scale, entrepreneurs travel a lonely road. But our journey to create doesn't have to be alone. As faith-driven leaders, we are part of a vibrant community. The industry and address may look different, and yet our shared identity is firmly rooted in Christ. The good news? You don't have to hop on a plane to find this movement. It's wherever you are. This is especially true with our faith-driven entrepreneur groups. Gather with other like-minded business owners online or in person. Start with an eight-week foundation course. From there, continue meeting monthly. No cost, no catch, just connection. Already thousands of entrepreneurs from nearly 100 different countries have connected with one another. Featuring dozens of episodes filmed around the world, video stories and teachings address issues common to faith-driven entrepreneurs. These groups give you time to share and discuss together. From our identity and our calling, to the ways we pursue excellence and steward what God has entrusted to us. Perhaps this is the first time you're in community with like-minded entrepreneurs. Or maybe this is quickly becoming a part of your journey. Wherever you are, others can meet you there. Be reminded that we're all connected to something bigger than any one person, business, or country. Faith-driven entrepreneur is made up of each one of us, and it is driven by all of us. Together, we're making the journey of entrepreneurs less lonely.